Welcome to another episode of The Metroid Story. Last time in this series, I detailed not just one of the greatest Metroid games of all time, but one of the greatest video games of all time, Super Metroid. And at the same time, sent viewers into a full-blown panic about the animals. The poor animals. Did Samus rescue them? Did she leave them behind as they exploded on the planet? Or did they escape? But it's canon! Where are they? Somebody help them, please. Shout out to the countless comments all saying the same thing not shown here. The last chapter covered Nintendo's quest to create a superior sequel, jam-packed with various improvements, and the universal praise it still receives to this day. Samus Aran responded to the theft of the surviving baby Metroid and discovered that Mother Brain's space pirate base on Zebes was rebuilt. After landing on the planet that was once her home, she destroyed their operations, finally put an end to her longtime nemesis Ridley, and triggered the trap meant to destroy her, at the cost of the entire planet Zebes and the baby Metroid that saved her life. While Super Metroid is seen among many in the fanbase as the greatest Metroid game, our next chapter explores a game which received a very different, much more mixed reaction. We return to the age of the Nintendo Wii, Nintendo's motion control centric TV smashing console. All I do is throw that ball up in the air, and when I- Oh, jeez! Before we get going, today's sponsor is my Patreon page. If you'd like to support my content, you can become a GamerThumb TV patron and gain access to my Patreon feed and Discord channel, filled with early access YouTube videos, weekly progress reports, behind the scenes posts, and sneak peeks at upcoming projects. Click the link in the description below. Just after the year 2007, at the time, the latest released entry in the Metroid Saga, besides a collection of the Prime games, was the also Wii exclusive Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. Overall, it was successful and it met with positive reviews, but at the time it also served as a conclusion to the Prime series. The entire future of Metroid was in question. What form would the next game take? What story would it tell now that Mother Brain, the Space Pirates, Ridley and the Metroids were all gone? The next idea was the brainchild of series producer Yoshio Sakamoto and began with a simple question, who was Samus Aran? By that point in time, she had no specific personality besides the one players had invented in their minds, based almost completely on her body language or facial expressions alone. In game, her backstory, her thoughts, her emotions had never been explored. Samus was essentially you, the player, and whoever you wanted Samus to be. Sakamoto sought to change that. My past is not a memory. It's a force at my back. It pushes and steers. I may not always like where it leads me, but like any story, the past needs resolution. A risky move when players had already headcanoned the character's personality. His goal was to lift the mystery from the character of Samus and present her as a flawed, relatable human being under all of that power armor, and keep her personality consistent with future titles in the series. Gameplay-wise, he sought to keep the next entry set in a fully 3D world, but have it feel like a 2D game, with controls as simple as an NES game which would appeal to modern players seeking a more comfortable experience. Instead of the heavy reliance of motion controls of Metroid Prime 3, this new game would use the Wii Remote turned sideways just like an NES controller, leaving most motion controls behind. This time Retro Studios wasn't involved, and Sakamoto's development team had no experience in producing a 3D game, so he put together a group that was labeled Project M, combining staff from within Nintendo, Team Ninja, and D-Rockets all with their own designed responsibilities. Sakamoto himself wrote the storyline of the game, and he approached Team Ninja after being impressed by the 2004 Ninja Gaiden. They tailored their engine into a new experience for the next Metroid, and D-Rockets was brought in to work on the cinematics. They were a company known for creating high-quality CG animation for video games and commercials, and their work on Metroid was described as being overwhelming. Nintendo wanted the cinematic sequences at the same quality as the gameplay segments to make them feel seamless, so D-Rockets had to adapt over 300 storyboards into cinematics. The work took 6 months and 10 teams. 
It was such an extensive use of cutscenes that it required other M copies to be pressed onto dual layer DVD discs. DVDs that can hold more information than a standard one. Team Ninja focused on the programming and 3D modeling side of development, and total production of the title took three years. The world received their first public look at E3 2009, to an uproar of excitement. Could a new, edgier game also be coming from us? The answer is absolutely. The game was titled Other M, and fans waited excitedly for its release just over a year away. Experiencing a game with a fully voiced Samus with fast-paced Ninja Gaiden-style combat generated a huge amount of anticipation, and at E3 2010, Metroid Other M was on the show floor with a playable demo. The finished product released in North America on August 31st, 2010, to a mixed reception and some technical issues. One bug in particular caused a specific door in the game that was supposed to open to instead permanently lock and Nintendo had to set up a program to repair affected files, but the player had to send in their SD card or Wii console, a reminder that this was before the days of on-the-fly game updates. In addition to a game-ending bug, Nintendo also recognized that some Wii consoles may have trouble reading the dual-layer disc used, if the disc drive lens was contaminated. Generally, Other M received mostly positive reviews with some similar criticisms across the board. Most of the positive ones praised the game's simple control scheme and combat mechanics. Most of the negative criticisms didn't come from the gameplay, but the story instead. Regardless of personal opinions, Other M still sold well, but below expectations. In Japan, it was the third best-selling game during its release week. In North America that September, it was the ninth best-selling game with 173,000 copies sold. Much to Nintendo's disappointment, as of 2019, Other M is one of the few games in the series to not break 1 million units shipped. The aspects commonly brought up as negative criticisms towards Other M are Samus' reaction to Ridley, some of the overly dramatic dialogue, and a relationship with Adam. Although, to be fair, I think there's good story reasons for all of it, and Samus' PTSD easily works like real-life PTSD, or a specific event could trigger a completely unexpected episode, with no clear logic involved. But this video isn't a review of the game. I'm not here to give Other M a score or debate the quality of the writing. I'm here to analyze the story presented to us. This video will explore the psychology of Samus Aran on her next mission and answer some questions. What could make someone so vulnerable after years of being a battle-hardened warrior? How does Samus handle being faced with multiple callbacks to her past just after losing the baby Metroid and the home she was raised in? As usual, this video is not a gameplay walkthrough either. Some gameplay elements might not be in the correct order to tell a coherent story. And as far as the flashbacks and other M, there is a lot of them. We're not really going to cover many. Those story bits have already been detailed chronologically in my previous Metroid videos, so no need to revisit the same materials. And with that, I welcome you to the Metroid Story, Chapter 10, Rebirth of Evil. Mother Brain was no more, and Planet Zebes was in its death throes. The trap triggered by her destruction sent the entire world into a violent explosion that Samus barely escaped from. She was away from the initial blast, but the danger was still very much present. The remains of Zebes were ejected into space, and large pieces of its remains rocketed through the debris of the nearby Seri station, and also threatened to smash into Samus' ship. Samus was barely able to maneuver through the chaos, but ultimately made it to safety on the other side. As silence fell, she discovered that she wasn't the only one that survived the explosion. Much to her surprise, she turned around to see some of Zebes' native wildlife inside her ship. They found their way on board before it took off, peaceful animals that pose no danger. A small comfort in an otherwise tragic scenario. Samus felt responsible for their safety and transported them to a research station orbiting SR388, operated by Biologic Space Laboratories for the purpose of studying various life forms from different planets. The animals would be kept safe on the station in a recreation of their natural habitat. 
From their new home, they peered through the window and watched Samus's ship leave. Her new course was set to return to the Galactic Federation headquarters. Samus hadn't reported in since her mission to destroy the Metroids on SR388, and she arrived with news of her success. Mission completed. The planet Zevis was annihilated, and all Metroids were exterminated. The Federation celebrated the destruction of the Metroids and the Space Pirates, but Samus felt emptiness. Although she'd only spent a short time with the baby, she formed a bond with it and felt incredible guilt. The baby saw Samus as its mother, and it gave its life to save her. The Federation saw her recent missions as an enormous success, but for the first time since Samus became an independent bounty hunter, cracks were beginning to form in her confidence. As far as she was concerned, she failed. She failed to save the baby, she brought the space pirate attack on the scientist of Ceres Station, then she walked straight into Mother Brain's trap, only to see her old home obliterated and the explosion almost annihilated her. Mother Brain almost got exactly what it wanted. Samus's close brush with death left her shaken, and her thoughts were troubled, causing sleepless nights filled with nightmares, hearing the baby's painful cry. After returning to the Galactic Federation headquarters, Samus had a routine systems check performed on her power suit to ensure that no long-term damage was present from her mission to Zebes. Her weapon systems were intact, tested against several holographic threats, and her defense capabilities were functional. Samus was cleared for duty, free to accept another mission. For a time, she explored the infinite void of the cosmos aimlessly with no specific destination, reflecting on the silence. Since the final destruction of Zebes and Mother Brain, the space pirates hadn't been heard from. It seemed that for now, a semblance of peace had returned to the galaxy. At the same time, a squad of Galactic Federation troops responded to a distress signal known as Baby's Cry, coming from a space station located in a remote region of the galaxy. A Baby's Cry SOS was named after the urgency its name implied and Samus was close enough to pick it up on her scanners also. She decided to respond and assist in any way that she could. The signal took her to Cosmo's region A47, and when she arrived, she discovered an enormous space station surrounded by a cloud of dust. The facility was either abandoned here for a long time, or somebody was trying to hide it in this area purposely. Once Samus landed and departed her gunship, she found herself in an airtight colony known as a bottle ship, an enclosed structure capable of supporting life for long periods of time. And near the entrance, she caught a glimpse of the Galactic Federation insignia. The bottle ship was military. But she'd never heard of a Federation base this remote. As she traveled through its empty, desolate hallways, Samus realized that she wasn't the first one to respond to the baby's cry signal. Ah, fancy meeting you here, princess. Remember me? Anthony. Haven't seen you since that last mission. Hey, and your buddy's here too. Adam Malkovich. 
a general in the Galactic Federation Army. Not only a trusted confidant, but also my former superior officer. Yes, there was a time when I was enrolled in the Galactic Federation Army. What are you doing here? This was an unexpected reunion. Samus was quite familiar with this team of soldiers. It was the 7th platoon of the Galactic Federation Army, trained on the capital planet of Daibon. This team was Adam Malkovich's unit, Samus's former superior officer, and one of her closest military friends, Anthony Higgs, was currently under Malkovich's command. It had been some time since she'd seen them, and Adam was just as surprised to see her on the ship, but he was a by-the-book commander, strongly adhering to the chain of command at mission parameters. Samus was no longer military, and she wasn't hired to assist on the mission. She was an outsider. But even her status as an unauthorized participant didn't keep them from needing Samus' help. The 7th platoon was struggling to break through one of the station's security doors, requiring a centralized blast of power, accommodations that her Chozo power suit could provide. team went on ahead, and Samus, knowing that Adam wouldn't share mission details with her, began investigating on her own to determine where the distress signal came from, and what purpose the station served. Instantly, her suspicions were on high alert. The bottle ship was teeming with wildlife. Wildlife she was quite familiar with from planet Zebes. She knew some stations sustained and studied animals from various worlds, but none of them allowed them to roam freely around the station. Something must have gone terribly wrong here. She returned to the 7th platoon to inform Adam of her discovery. He's dead. Someone or something attacked him. Get away from me! The 7th platoon had never seen this creature before, and officially it was designated as ULF-27, Unidentified Life Form 27. Although it was a rare creature on Zebes, Samus recognized it as a brug mass, a swarm of insects known as brugs connected as a hive mind, and forming a defensive structure to protect the Emperor Brug. The Emperor Brug was the central figure of the hive mind, and the top of its shell resembled an eyeball. They were vulnerable to ice to slow them down or stop their movements, and shooting the body would result in more brugs replacing the dead ones. The only way to stop the mass of insects was to destroy the Emperor Brug in its center. With enough firepower, the rest would collapse. Samus, looks like I'm gonna need to ask for your cooperation on this mission, but I'm also gonna have to ask that you follow my commands. You don't move unless I say so, and you don't fire until I say so. It was clear that having Samus involved with her expertise would be a huge asset to the mission after the battle with the Brugmas. In a rare display of breaking military protocol, Adam brought Samus into the mission with some restrictions. Without her, some of his troops might have lost their lives. But he also knew Samus and her power suit very well and the incredible power that they possessed. Through her actions, either directly or indirectly, entire space pirate bases were wiped out and entire planets have been destroyed. It would take one misplaced power bomb to blow a hole in the ship or unintentionally vaporize one of his troops. Strict adherence to his orders would be required, and none of her advanced weapon systems were to be used without his authorization. This was strictly a military mission, and Samus understood the need to authorize the use of her more advanced weaponry. She agreed to Adam's terms and listened as he laid out the current mission objectives. What transpired on the ship before they 
they arrived was still a mystery. Multiple casualties were on board with injuries from an unidentified lethal creature. Any survivors were to be brought to safety. The bottle ship was separated into multiple sectors used for various research purposes. Adam determined the most effective use of 7th Platoon would be to split responsibilities among the team. Lyle Smithsonian, their special ops explosive expert, was sent to investigate Sector 1. Maurice Favreau was sent to Sector 2 to repair any Federation equipment he came across with his engineering skills. Anthony Higgs was sent as point man to Sector 3 to determine if using plasma weapons would be necessary. James Pierce, the communications expert, was sent to the control bridge to re-establish outside contact. K.G. Misawa, the recon scout, was responsible for sweeping the residential quarters for survivors. And Samus was sent to the system management room to get the ship's electrical systems back up and running. That's the end of the briefing. It was the first joint mission I'd been a part of since becoming a freelance bounty hunter. And of course, it was the first time since my Federation days that I was following the orders of a commanding officer. Understood, Adam. No objections, of course. This elevator is bound for Sector 1. A level 3. Warning is now in effect in Sector 1. Please avoid traveling alone and remain armed. Stay alert to your surroundings at all times. Samus began her mission by heading to the Sector 1 biosphere. The biosphere was the equivalent of a gigantic greenhouse containing jungles, artificial rainfall, waterfalls, tropical environments filled with aggressive predators. And the area left no doubt in Samus's mind that the bottle ship was in fact recreating the environment on Zebes. The biosphere and its creatures were almost exactly what she experienced in the Brinstar region of Zebes. Questions filled her head. Why was Zebes being recreated on the ship and who was behind it? The predators she encountered were also altered, unnaturally aggressive, the same type of behaviors exhibited by the Zabesian animals under Mother Brain's telepathic influence. But Mother Brain was conclusively destroyed. Something or someone was affecting their behaviors, including those of the rare Galmanians, chameleon-like creatures that could camouflage themselves, and the armadillo-like Gryptians that packed a hard exterior. Although dangerous, neither of these species seemed to be dangerous enough to answer the question of all the bodies the 7th platoon had been finding around the ship. Deep inside the biosphere, Samus found a cage-like room where something had been living up until recently, and in the middle of the room, another body. The man was torn to shreds so violently he couldn't be identified. Whatever did this to him was vicious, and Samus felt like something was watching him. Perhaps his killer was still nearby. It seemed to be a false alarm. The small, almost bird-like life form that Samus encountered wasn't like anything she recognized, and her database on Zebes had no information on it. It couldn't have possibly been the culprit of the killings, but it watched her with an intense curiosity. Samus was left with an uneasy feeling from the encounter, almost a strange familiarity. But with no answers to be found, she continued fighting her way through the Brinstar-like jungle of the Biosphere, and learned that some of the visible nature was simply a hologram hiding the cold, lifeless steel of a derelict space station. Although artificial, the deep canyons and simulated sky were convincing at first glance. To find her way through Sector 1, Samus had to continue disabling holograms, hiding the exiting doorways, and disturbing the animals nearby. Just outside the biosphere, two large threats broke through Sector 1's walls. But these organisms weren't native to Brinstar on Zebes. They must have burrowed through the vents from another sector. Two huge tunnel worms normally native to the fiery Norfair region of Zebes. 
Under normal circumstances, the worms were mostly stationary and living within the walls of Norfair. On the bottle ship, they were roaming freely and quick to attack, completely going against their mostly passive nature. The two tunnel worms were destroyed, but they weren't the only incredible dangers found within Sector 1. Some of Zebe's most dangerous organisms were the many insect-like species deep within Burnstar's wet forests, and many of them were social insects that functioned as a colony. Samus unintentionally dropped into the heart of a key hunter nest, bee-like insects that had assigned roles and a hierarchy led by the king key hunter in the middle of the nest. Again, the mysterious creature that was watching Samus before returned, this time feeding feverishly on the substance left behind by the nest. Could this thing have been following her? For now, Samus had no reason to harm it. Perhaps it was simply curious or hungry and desired to feed on the spoils of Samus's victories. After traveling further in, Samus reached her objective and met with the rest of 7th Platoon in the Information Center. Lyle Smithsonian was missing though, possibly still completing his objectives. He hadn't reported in in a while and the CPU in the nearby system had self-destructed. Most of the station's data was missing, and Maurice began attempting to recover the missing files. While Maurice worked through the repairs, Samus and Anthony reminisced that the area outside looked like the Federation training grounds they were trained on. Just then, an alarm sounded from a nearby chamber, and Samus went to investigate, only to find a terrible truth. Adam, are you seeing this? It is a Beezian. It was a cybernetically enhanced organism that resembled a space pirate, but adorned with a Federation insignia and deactivated. Samus instantly reported her findings to Adam, but Maurice uncovered some information from the files he was able to rebuild from the damaged database. This bottle ship is under management of the Galactic Federation. In these facilities, Life forms from each planet have been raised and researched as possible bioweapons. Site manager and development director, Dr. Madeline Bergman. Adam, was the Galactic Federation experimenting with bioweapons? Looks like it. Use of bioweapons is strictly prohibited. Of course it is. What's happened here is illegal. The ramifications were disturbing. 7th Platoon had just uncovered that the Galactic Federation, responsible for the safety of all the citizens in the galaxy, contained elements that were working on illegal bioweapons, prohibited by galactic law. Adam wasn't aware of the illegal program and was strongly against the use of living things as weapons. Using them would make the Federation no different than the space pirates in their activities. For now, they would continue scouting the building for more evidence. The cybernetic remains Samus found earlier was one of many, 
the secret Federation program had bred an entire army of space pirates. Samus had no idea how they could have possibly accomplished such a feat, but their features were unmistakable. They were the same genetic markers as the ones on Zebes, but these space pirates were much stronger, covered in cybernetic plating engineered by the Federation, and also completely out of control. After dealing with the space pirates, Samus rushed outside and found the monster that was driving them into a frenzy. Seventh Platoon and Samus were able to hold back the attack and made a tragic discovery. The missing Lyle was found, his body torn to shreds like the rest, and the creature they just battled had consumed parts of his flesh. Nearby, Samus followed a trail of fluids leading to an empty carcass. An empty shell. Looks like that monster from earlier infiltrated Sector 3. Samus, follow it. It was the small animal that was watching Samus earlier, but its insides were missing as if it exploded from within or they were scooped out. Could it have fallen prey to the vicious lizard, or was there a deeper meaning behind the remains? For now, Samus had no time to figure out the mystery. She had to follow the trail of destruction the monster's rampage left behind. Whatever the Federation created in the bottle ship, was too dangerous to be kept alive. And Samus also needed to find the director of the program, Dr. Madeline Bergman, for answers. There was much more to the situation than it seemed on the surface. In the distance, an explosion could be heard. Someone had said an explosive in the information center where much of the data on the projects on board the bottle ship was stored. And Samus rushed into Sector 3 following the creature's trail, the Pyrosphere. Completely different than the Biosphere, the Pyrosphere was extremely hot and filled with rocky caverns and lava. The life forms found within the hot tunnels and steaming open areas were all from Zeba's Norfair region. Life forms adapted to the extreme pressure and choking heat, nothing Samus wasn't quite accustomed to already. The only way through the sector was through the artificial volcano spewing flaming rocks into its atmosphere, and a creature made its home inside of it, the Goyagma, a reptilian animal with clawed hands and tentacles that thrived in blazing heat. Destroying the Goyagma caused the lava to drain from the volcano, allowing Samus to push forward into the much colder Pyrosphere. The temperatures were also on the opposite extreme compared to the Pyrosphere, but Samus's suit could handle it just as well, and the Cryosphere held many secrets with heavy ramifications. Samus came across the frozen corpse of an organism that had recognizable wounds. It appeared as if it carried marks from Metroid feeding. Samus deduced that that was simply impossible. Besides the fact that they were now extinct, if the Federation somehow had Metroids, they couldn't survive the cold environment anyways. Something else must have killed it. Samus' thoughts raced through her mind with the possibilities, but she never anticipated that there was an enemy within. Whoa. 
Maurice. Samus found the body of Maurice frozen on the ground, and a stranger was watching from a nearby window. Finally, a survivor that can hold answers she was looking for. She was terrified of Samus, and she witnessed the death of Maurice. His killer was on the inside. It was one of the 7th Platoon squad members. It was obvious the Federation as a whole didn't know about the illegal bioweapons program, and the higher-ups sent an infiltrator to cover it up. Even if it meant killing the entire team from within. A deleter. Listen to me. We're here to rescue you. Hurry, this way. Samus, the wavelength of that monster's cry is driving the other creatures into a frenzy. They've grown markedly more aggressive. It appears to be hiding in Sector 3 now. Take the elevator ahead of you to the main sector. Samus couldn't identify the killer since he was attempting to destroy her with a Pharaoh Crusher. If it weren't for her suit, he might have succeeded. Samus disabled the Pharaoh Crusher, but the deleter was gone. And Samus believed the stranger was Dr. Madeline Bergman. Since Dr. Bergman witnessed the murder of Maurice, she believed the Galactic Federation sent a killer to keep the existence of the Bioweapons Project secret, which made her a target. Samus had to keep her safe, and Adam informed her that the wavelength of the mystery creature's roars was driving the other creatures to act out, and he had a visual on it heading towards another sector. For now, Samus had to leave Madeline behind. The bottle ship was very much a nightmare version of Zebes, and Samus wondered if Dr. Bergman was the person who sent the distress signal. Before Samus arrived, the deleter reached another one of his targets, this time ambushing and killing Keiji Misawa, and dumping his body in the fires of the pyrosphere, ensuring that no evidence would be found. Samus fought her way through the chilling air of the cryosphere, and space pirates were quickly infesting every nook and cranny of the station, including the transport elevators where they waited to ambush travelers. During her route back, she met up with Anthony Higgs. She couldn't imagine he could be the traitor, but much time had passed since they spoke regularly. Could he have been compromised? Anthony claimed that Adam wanted the 7th platoon to regroup and travel together, but Anthony was the only one to show up. He had no idea the deleter had wiped out most of the team already. His first objective was to head into the geothermal power plant and restore power in the area. But Samus traveled ahead knowing there was still a dangerous organism living inside the lava, the large fish-like Vorash.
Josh was no longer a threat, but the monster Samus was chasing was still very much on the loose somewhere in the Pyrosphere. She was getting closer, and soon, one of the worst nightmares from her past would reveal itself. An impossibility beyond imagining. Get out the way! Man! Get your thing in here! We gotta clear out! Where's the exit at? Duck! This ain't good. Well, only one thing to do, huh? Let's tear this thing up! Wait, Anthony! Leave this one to me! Don't waste your plasma. It was Ridley. She was still dealing with the aftermath of losing the baby, and the close brush with death she had when she fell from Mother Brain's trap left her in a fragile state of mind. Samus had taken barely any time to recover before arriving at the bottle ship, and Ridley's appearance triggered the trauma of her past. Last time she saw him, he was weakened from his multiple defeats. A shell of his former self. No Phazon, no cybernetics, and attempting to run away from her. But this time he appeared exactly as he did the day her parents died. Flames behind him, young and powerful, an unstoppable monster. Her trauma as a child came flooding back quickly and without warning. She found herself unable to breathe, and feeling she thought she conquered years ago when she first defeated Ridley. If Samus couldn't regain control of her emotions, Anthony would lose his life. She decided to fight back, but could barely focus, and multiple scenarios ran through her head. How could Ridley have possibly survived the explosion on Zebes? Could he even be destroyed? His body was burning in Norfair only moments before the entire world was destroyed. There should have been nothing left. And suddenly, the realization hit her. This was not Ridley. The creature she'd been chasing this entire time was right in front of her. The scientist on board the bottle ship must have recreated Ridley and had no idea the monster they brought back. When the animals from Zebes were first cloned, one of the ones grown was the small furry one that Samus encountered and none of the scientists can identify what species it was. They affectionately named it Little Birdie. Nobody knew what species Ridley belonged to, and nobody had ever seen Ridley in his younger stages. It used its harmless appearance to get the scientists close, even going as far as playing dead. Then it began feeding throughout the ship, until it consumed enough flesh to grow, leaving its old body behind and growing into its adolescent form. The Ridley in front of Samus was the full-grown adult in his prime. When she put the pieces together, Samus' fearlessness returned. This wasn't Ridley, it was Little Birdie. He had no history with Samus. It was simply a rampaging monster that needed to be put down. A cheap imitation of her greatest foe.
Seamus's plasma beams tore through the cloned Ridley. It was hurt badly, but survived and escaped to cause more damage. And Anthony was gone. Samus felt incredible guilt. She couldn't let herself be compromised again to avoid others being hurt in her battles. In retrospect, there's no way Anthony was the deleter. He tried to save her life and lost his selflessly. The hunt for Ridley continued, and Samus picked up another life form. It was Dr. Madeline Bergman again. She still didn't trust Samus and believed the Federation sent her, but Samus clarified that she was an independent bounty hunter here to protect her. Now, with a moment's rest, she was able to provide some answers, and Madeline explained how everything on the ship went haywire. The Galactic Federation was attempting to create a special forces unit comprised of controllable bioweapons, and they decided to use the Space Pirates as a basis. She saw how the Space Pirates were controlled by their higher ranks, and believed they could recreate the hierarchy for Federation purposes. The Zabesians would be the primary combatants of the unit. But when the Ridley clone grew, they became uncontrollable. When the situation became too big to contain, Madeline sent the distress signal. Samus also had a fierce intelligence and she immediately recognized that some of the events happening made no sense. Madeline was concerned that these clones would become a full space pirate force again, but with no specific leader guiding them down that path, they would just be a swarm of violent drones, not an organized group. Madeline should have known this. Also, the Federation could easily destroy the bottle ship with their military might, but instead they chose to send a team in complete with a deleter. There was something bigger they were hiding inside. Madeline decided to show Samus what their biggest project was. What? That's not possible. The Metroids were terminated along with Zebis. The Metroid militarization plan, and Samus was the reason it happened. Just like the space pirates, they were trying to weaponize Metroids. When Samus returned from Zebes and was doing her routine checkups, the Federation scientists secretly collected genetic samples from her suit of everything that Samus encountered on Zebes. They used the collected data to clone them on the ship. The Ridley clone, the space pirates, all the Zebesian animals, and the Metroids grown from the baby's DNA. All particles from her suit. On Zebes, Samus also saw that the space pirates were attempting to control Metroids through Mother Brain's telepathy. Madeline confirmed that Mother Brain wasn't one of the clones created, but what they did was potentially worse. They created an artificial intelligence that reproduced Mother Brain's thought process. They labeled it MB, and just like Mother Brain, the AI program began evolving and became self-aware. The cloned Metroids and MB had to be destroyed. Not even the Galactic Federation should have the kind of power they offered. The bottle ship contained a hidden sector called Sector Zero, which only the highest ranking ringleaders knew about. Sector Zero was created to mimic the Turian region of Zebes, and the AIMB was placed inside. The Federation was making the same mistakes that turned Zebes into a nightmare planet. Metroids and an AI given too much power, the entire galaxy would be in danger again after Samus spent years trying to take their operation down, only to leave elements of her employer picking up the pieces and continuing their work. Once Samus left, the deleter found Madeline, and he was never seen again. path to Sector Zero was a desolate area, comprised of multiple security features, including heavy gravity meant to crush any intruders, but Samus' gravity suit feature only made that a minor inconvenience. The heavy gravity in the area was controlled by a bioengineered mechanical life form called the Nightmare, organic on the inside and fused with cybernetic components throughout its body, to control gravitational fields and maintain security.
The nightmare system was deactivated, and Samus rushed through the cold, empty steel corridors of Sector Zero. The silence was foreboding, and she had no idea what this mysterious MB looked like. Where would the AI program be housed, and what defenses would she have to stand up against to get to it? And something was also watching her. Samus, can you hear my voice? The Metroid that appeared sounded exactly like the cries of the baby, since it was cloned from the baby's genes. But this baby didn't have the same attachment to Samus the original did. It was a wild Metroid, only seeking to feed. But why had Adam caught her off guard and disabled her power suit? As her old commander, he was one of the few people who knew Samus well enough to know how to temporarily disable her power suit for just a moment, and he needed her down to prevent her from stopping his next actions, and to protect her from the unknown terrors of these new cloned Metroids. Adam revealed everything he discovered about the project. Sector Zero Metroids couldn't be frozen. The only weakness a Metroid had was overcome through the Federation's genetic manipulation. They created weapons more terrifying than anything the Space Pirates had ever devised. Metroids without weakness, completely invincible. Luckily, the one she just encountered was young, and its ice resistance hadn't appeared yet. The body of the creature in the cryosphere with Metroid wounds now made sense to Samus. The cold environment didn't stop the Metroids from feeding. Mass producing them would be a disaster. Adam determined that nobody had the technology to defeat the new Metroids, not even Samus. And Samus questioned why his name was on the report. Did Adam know what the Federation was doing? In fact, Adam outlined the dangers of using Metroids as a military weapon. And the Federation headquarters agreed, but a small group went rogue and initiated the secret program. Now the station was on a collision course with Galactic Federation headquarters, a path set forth by the MBAI. The ship had to be diverted to avoid collision. With his final request, he commanded Samus to find and destroy the cloned Ridley, and not to trust Madeline Bergman. Adam would take care of the Metroids by detaching the portion of the ship with the Sector Zero Metroids and destroy it at the cost of his own life. If Samus had her power suit ready, she would have surely attempted to stop him, as she demonstrated when his brother Ian was lost. Only the mission mattered. Don't you dare, Adam. Let me go in. I'm the only one who has a shot against the Metroids. We have to take the chance. Please, Adam. You have to trust me. You have to trust me. Just give me a chance. Samus, I wish I could battle Ridley, but I can't. Unlike you, I'm no galactic savior. I'm merely human. But I can save you. You should be completely healed soon. There isn't much time. We both need to get started on our missions. I'm sorry for getting a little rough with you. Good luck, Samus.
Samus was devastated. Adam was like a father to her, and now he was gone. Another victim of the Zebes aftermath. It was time to complete the mission. Adam's sacrifice would not be in vain. Adam vanished. My best friend. The person who understood me best. The closest thing to a father I had. I think Adam granted me that Eye of the Storm clarity, his final gift to me. There was no time for me to grieve his death, but there was time for me to say, Adam, thank you. Leave the rest to me. With the Sector Zero Metroids destroyed, all that remained was MB and Ridley. But much to Samus' surprise, she would not encounter the Ridley clone again. Samus returned to Madeline and found the body of James Pierce. He was the deleter. After attempting to destroy Madeline, he found himself on the receiving end. But how did she take on an expertly trained Federation assassin? There must be much more to Madeline Bergman than what was on the surface. Samus followed the nearby blood trail. It matched the same DNA of the Ridley clone. It was definitely weakened and wounded from the battle with Samus and was waiting for her in the next room. Instead of finding the threat waiting to ambush her, she found a much more ghastly sight. The Ridley clone was dead. Only a lifeless husk remained. Clear signs that his life force was absorbed by Metroids. But if Adam destroyed the Sector Zero Metroids, what could have killed Ridley? Just around the corner, another survivor. <gasps> No. No. No, you've got it wrong. Stay away. Stay away. You have to calm down. Wait. Metroid eggs. It can't be. Metroid Queen. The Federation grew a queen from the baby's DNA. It was the only explanation since Samus confronted the queen on SR388, not on Zebes. It not only demonstrated how far the Federation had gone, but also how truly rare the baby was. It would have eventually grown into a queen of its own. Stay 
away from me. I'm here to secure your safety. What's your role at this facility? I'm responsible for all operations. My name is Madeline Bergman. Wait a minute. I met another woman who called herself Madeline Bergman. What's going on here? The Queen was no more. The second one annihilated by Samus, truly putting an end to the current Metroid threat. Only the mystery of MB remained. Samus still had no idea where to find the AI, but she did find the remaining survivor. The other Madeline Bergman story was all a fiction. She was MB the entire time. The person Samus had met before was named Melissa. Although she was just an android body housing the Mother Brain AI, the real Madeline Bergman sent the distress signal. When MB was first created, she didn't have a human form. She was an AI modeled after Mother Brain, including her resemblance to the Federation's Aurora units. Once the Metroids were cloned, a human-like body was built for MB to give the Metroids a mother in an effort to control them just as the baby believed Samus was its mother. Samus and the baby's relationship was the template for the entire experiment. The Queen was the first Metroid to mature from the experiment and she was unaltered, yet the future Metroids were altered to be resistant to cold. The growth of the Queen was completely unexpected. MB lived and worked alongside the rest of the humans on the bottle ship. She learned exceedingly fast and her ability to act human was indistinguishable from an actual human being. In time, conflict appeared when she began developing emotions and her opinions began contradicting her fellow scientists. And B began believing that her opinions were superior. These humans were beneath her, exactly as Mother Brain had evolved alongside the Chozo. MB's rapid learning and human-like existence became an unsettling effect of her development, and the scientists decided to alter her programming to make her less independent. Dr. Bergman began caring for MB and even gave her the human name Melissa, but she did nothing the day MB was taken by their superiors. And then MB turned to protect herself. Stop! What are you doing to her? These orders are from above. Take her away. Wait. Wait. She reached out to me and asked Calm me down. for help. But there was nothing I could do. What's happening? Once she felt abandoned and hunted by that same Madeline, MB telepathically commanded the special forces to revolt. The facility fell into complete chaos. and suffered widespread damage. <laughs> With that act, all of the Galactic Federation became her enemy, and MB planned to crash the bottle ship into the Federation headquarters, unleashing Metroids and the Space Pirates. But the arrival of Samus and Adam's platoon destroyed her plans. Just then, MB appeared and threatened Madeline with a weapon. If she couldn't destroy all of galactic society, at least the doctor that failed to keep her safe would pay. Madeline begged her to stand down before it was too late. If the military arrived and found her as a threat, they wouldn't hesitate to destroy her. Please listen. <sighs> Madeline, step back. The humans were foolish and I was forced to bring judgment on them. And yet because of you, I failed. <laughs>
Sir Masarin, I heard what happened. You performed admirably. You can leave the rest to us. <laughs> Unfortunate what happened to Commander Malkovich. And to think that his entire unit was annihilated. Truly a tragic day. With them gone, you're just an outsider. And given your unofficial status, I cannot allow you contact with the witness. With your predilection for transporting illegal cargo like infant Metroids. Time for the lady to go home. Someone escort her. Yes, sir. Time for us to go. Come on, princess. What? Stop right there. Who are you? Anthony Hicks, sir. Galactic Federation Platoon 7. I need to secure the safety of any survivors, Commander Malkovich's orders, and the purpose of this mission. What? Authorized by the Chairman of the Galactic Federation. Of course. Anthony was alive, somehow surviving the fall during the battle with Ridley. Galactic Federation backup arrived and MB was taken down. She left them with no choice but to use deadly force. In an attempt to keep Samus and Dr. Bergman quiet, the Federation commander threatened to paint Samus as a criminal and isolate Bergman. But thanks to Anthony's survival as the last remaining 7th platoon member, his orders were still active. Instead, he brought in the final survivors. For now, the corrupt elements of the Galactic Federation had failed, and the trio returned home. The mission was successful, but Samus' own personal mission wasn't over. The Federation made the choice to completely destroy the bottle ship, and Samus made her way back to it. She needed to retrieve something that was left behind, an invaluable memento she couldn't bear to leave. As she made her way through the ship, she found how empty it was compared to when she was there. The Federation definitely had been there and removed specimens and equipment from the ship they wanted to keep quiet. But that was a battle for another day. For now, Samus had to tear through the remaining organisms to find the command center Adam used to communicate with her, and it wouldn't be easy. The ship was floating in a dangerous part of deep space for a long time, and all the electrical power inside attracted a rare creature that Samus faced before. Tomb, just like the one Samus faced on the wrecked Chosa ship on Zebes. That was a small one feeding on the electrical energy of the ship. This one was colossal, large enough to tear apart sections of the bottle ship with Samus still inside of it. Phantom's body overloaded with electrical energy and exploded in space, and Samus found the room that Adam was communicating from. Before he died, she noticed he wasn't wearing his helmet. She wouldn't leave it behind to be destroyed with the ship like it meant nothing. With this, she would always remember the sacrifice he made for the galaxy and for her. Madeline, thanks for telling me all this. I've got to destroy the Metroids and MB in Sector Zero. You have to remain hidden. No! Samus! Don't worry. The Galactic Federation CO, who's here now, will help you. The Galactic Federation activated the self-destruct sequence of the bottle ship. It was time to move. 
They activated it earlier than Samus anticipated, and she deduced that it was likely an attack on her. The corrupt elements deep inside the Federation must have been watching her and seen her as a future threat. But Samus was determined to escape to fight another day. She was the only one that could stand against the future threats of their irresponsible and sure to continue experiments. Join me next time for the Metroid Story, Part 11, Apex Predator. After Samus and the Galactic Federation 7th Platoon put an end to the Metroid militarization plan on board the bottle ship, she returns to the surface of SR388 with a research team and uncovers the terrifying truth behind the creation of the Metroids. A new unknown parasite attacks Samus and she awakens to find herself changed. And when she arrives at the nearby science station, she discovered those same parasites had taken over using multiple deadly forms and finds herself in a battle to the death against the most dangerous threat she's ever faced, herself.